and we're excited that you're joining us here today. Each message that is shared through the leadership here at Cornerstone is designed to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. However, we encourage you that this message should only be a supplement and not a replacement to the church that you should be plugged into and the pastor that God has given to shepherd and care for your soul. Enjoy and reflect and grow from this word that God has prepared. But man, what an incredible day to be here in the house of the Lord. Um, and just a few things before we get started is that November 17th is our next Steps class. Steps is where you need to be if you want to learn more about the church, learn about what we do, why we do it. It's super important for you to go there because it also helps you understand why we do church the way that we do church. And it'll help you understand our fundamental values, our core values, and our belief system. So we invite you guys. It's a free breakfast Got childcare provided. I keep talking about it. I think our record was like 10 pounds of bacon at the very first one we had. So we invite you guys to come. Um, it's an incredible time. It's super interactive. You get to learn about the ministries of the church, where you belong, where you can serve. You can also learn about our Sunday serve teams. And it's super important, we believe, why you're there. Because you'll have a chance to meet our staff, some of our elders, our mission team. Uh, it's just a great time for you to be there. Also, if you are not in a small group, we invite you to come to one. When you leave here today, stop by the red small group table. Get all the information you can about the 25 plus small groups that we have to get connected into the ministry of this church because Sunday is just not enough. And we understand that you need to have biblical community and accountability to the things in your walk and your faith. So we invite you to come to a small group. We'd love for you to sign up. And after that, I'm done with all the boring parts, so let's go ahead and let's jump right into it. I won't be real with you guys this week. It's been a really tough week. Usually when, in my short time of ministry, I have wrote a sermon, it's happened pretty quick. Usually on a Monday, I can sit down with the Lord, really begin to fall on my knees and find a word from him pretty quickly. Monday went by, nothing. Tuesday went by, nothing. Wednesday went by, nothing. I typed, I paced, I wrote down, I erased, I called friends, I called mentors, I prayed, I said, show me some tips, show me some tricks, I need some help, I am struggling. And I called Pastor Rich, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to meet him, but he is an incredible man. Um, he filled some big shoes for me. A lot of babies here at Cornerstone, if you don't know, we cry a lot. So he filled the shoes of my grandfather who passed away in 2004, and he said, what would be the one thing that you would say to them if you had a chance? I said, uh, I don't know. That's a good thing. I've never thought of it that way. So I went down to my kitchen table, and I just sat there, and I just looked at the Bible. And I had looked at a scripture that I had read so many times before, hundreds of times, and probably when I get to it, you guys will probably know. Some of you may even roll your eyes and say, I can't believe he's going to be preaching from this message when we talk about a generous life series and talking about finances and stewardship. And so many people come into the church and they say, oh, here we go, money and church. It's like peanut butter and jelly. You can't have one without the other. It's like Oreos and milk. You can't have one without the other. There is truth. We do take time to take up tithes and offerings in the church. But look, this is not man's money. This is not Cornerstone's money. This is God's money. We are stewards, which means we are just merely managers of what God has given us. I could sit up here for 52 weeks, which I wouldn't, and we could talk just about money. We could talk about stewardship. We could talk about the things that we believe you should do. And there are so many people here in this church that do tithe. They are sacrificial givers. And because of that, we are so thankful for them that we get to have the ability to expand our campuses now into two locations. We have the ability to hire staff. We have the ability to send $70,000 plus dollars into global missions across the world to advance the gospel into places where there's people aren't even allowed to be. So this isn't going to be a me begging you for more. This isn't me telling you need to go home and go for broke. This has nothing to do with this. The only way for you to really understand and for us to really say you need to become a tither is to put God first and your love for him is the ultimate priority in your life. 
to point yourself to God and to Jesus is the way in which that you will become a tither, that you will become a financial partner in the kingdom. It's not a financial partner in the church. Yes, your gifts, and they go forward to advance the local church. Yes, they go to Cornerstone, but it's God's kingdom. I want you to know something about God. He wants to be first. In the famous words of the best NASCAR race car driver in the world, Ricky Bobby, he said, if you're not first, you're last. And it's so funny, that little cliche comment from Will Ferrell himself is so true when it comes to God. There is no second for him. He's either first or he's last. God is a jealous God, and he wants to be first in your life. I will not go down the health and wealth gospel today. I promise you, I believe that it erodes the very truths of what God wants in our life. I don't subscribe to it. I don't want it. I hope you don't subscribe to it because at the end of the day, if you just listen to these guys on TV and you give all your money away, well, then you gave all your money away. Now you got no money. I want you to understand this is not what I'm going to be talking about today. And look, we're not buying any jets or yachts. And if we are, I promise you, you'll get a first class ride on one. Just kidding. But God doesn't need your money. He's got plenty of it. And to actually put it into perspective of what God thinks of money, he paved the streets of heaven with gold. There are rubies and jewels everywhere. We are here on earth. He is in heaven. It's already there. In order for God to bless you in the area of your finances, you must give it up to him. It's much like a batter at the plate. He cannot hit a home run until the pitcher throws a pitch. Now, really, that was a silent joke at Josh because somehow he can relate everything back to fishing. I can relate everything back to baseball. But I want to read you guys a story real quick that caught my eye recently, and I hope you get a chuckle out of it as much as I did too. So there was a woman who had just got done shopping at the local grocery store, and she began to go forward to her car, and she dropped her bags into her car, and to her surprise, there are four men inside her car. She pulled out her firearm and screamed at the top of her lungs. She says, I have a gun, and I know how to use it. Get out of the car. These men did not look for a second invitation. They got up out of the car, and they rolled. So the woman, understandably shaken, concerned for what just happened for her safety, she hurries, she rushes, and she starts unloading the grocery bags back into the car. And no matter how hard she tries, she cannot get the car started. She's panicking. She said, oh my gosh, there's four men out there. They are on the run. They're going to come back. They're going to kill me. And then it hit her. It wasn't her car. To her surprise, she looked over about four to five spaces away, and there sat her car. She looked around. She saw nobody else was there. She grabbed everything out of the car. She began to load her car. (laughs) She got into the car. She started it and drove away. She drove herself right to the police station. She wanted to turn herself in. The desk sergeant, after nearly hearing the story, fell out of his chair laughing As he said, he pointed down to the counter as there was four men shaking and trembling and crying. And one of the men said, there's a four foot seven woman that's got white curly hair that is madder than a wet hornet, brandishing a 45 caliber weapon, screaming at me to get out of her car. See, the truth of the story is that she really thought it was her car, but it really belonged to someone else. And the truth is, is that God owns everything. He owns that lady's car. He owns the mistake of whose car she thought it was. But see, God owns everything. And today we're going to go into the one area of the Bible that I have read. And like I said, I know I've read it so many times, and I'm sure that you guys have read it too. And it hit me the one time that I really began to read over this in multiple translations, in multiple forms, read different commentary. It really stuck out. There was something in there that I had never seen before. So let's go ahead and turn into Malachi 3. Verse 8, let the grumbling begin. I'm just kidding. Before we get in there, I want you to just hang in there. It's a really, really good thing. So let's go ahead and let's jump right in. Uh, If you have it, you guys can go ahead 
Uh, turn to it, hang on to that spot. I won't have you fumbling around going through multiple texts. There's only about two times I'll go through two different scriptures, and it'll also be behind me um, today. And today I actually uh, will be pulling this out of the New King James Version, uh, which is a curveball for me as I normally preach out of the NLT. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. See, the storehouse, what's being referred to is, is the local church. That there may be food in my house. Now, food, I'm not talking about the food that you eat. I'm talking about the food as in your spiritual food, the food that you digest while you were here at Sunday worship, why you were out at small groups, why we put on ministries of the church to go out. Because, look, our main point of our ministries is to point back to our mission statement, which is win the lost, disciple the one, and care for the community, and everything should point back to Jesus. And try me now in this. Some of you may have it says, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. So how do we receive this blessing of abundance? We must first bring our tithes and our offerings in so he can begin to financially bless us. And boom, 11, it hit me. I have read this so many times, and I have never seen this. It says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And those simple, simple words spoke to me so loudly for the first time. And it clearly says that he will rebuke who? The devourer. Who is the devourer? Satan. For our sake. So what do we have to do first? So the precept is, is what? Bring the tithe and the offering into the storehouse. And the promise is what? That he will rebuke Satan for us. Can I get an amen? So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Bow your heads and pray. God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. God, we ask today uh, that the words that would be on this would, would illuminate to us, God, that they would be so vibrant and clear. God, I pray for... Uh, just every soul that's in here today, that they came expectant to hear the word of God, that they came in with no distractions on what's going to be taking place today after we leave here. And God, we just are in awe of you. God, you are a good, good father. You supply our needs. You supply our riches. You bring righteousness. God, you are so awesome. God, may we just today fall at your feet and lay everything down there and just not pick it back up. God, we thank you that you are still in control. God, we pray for our brothers and sisters that can't even hold service today inside their building due to Hurricane Michael ripping through the panhandle. God, we lift them up name by name. We don't know their situations. God, we just, we thank you that you are still in control, that you still sit on the throne. God, maybe we may not take for granted our family members that are here and gone tomorrow and these storms of life that come and sometimes the big ones like this that really come physically. And God, we thank you for the celebration that took place with Pastor Andrew Brunson that came home. God, we bless that family. God, we thank you for our president who stood in the gap and was not willing to fade away from bringing a Christian pastor back home to the United States. God, we love you and we thank you and we praise your holy, holy name. We say all of this in the name of Jesus Christ and God's people said, amen. amen. And I do want to say, I'm not going to cross the political line, but I want to say there is something about a man who is praying in the name of Jesus Christ and praying for the Holy Spirit of wisdom to fall on our president. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you go on YouTube, go on Fox News, Instagram, or Facebook page and watch that. It'll give you goosebumps. It was incredible to hear the name of Jesus proclaimed by a man inside the White House. So the question to ask yourself today, and look, if you're not taking notes, I want you to go ahead and start taking notes. And if you're taking notes, continue to take notes and look on for your neighbor if you miss something. I'll try to talk slow. I write fast. 
making sure you guys caught that. All right. So the question to ask yourself is, is am I robbing God of the tithe? Or let's, let's do it this way. Am I robbing God of being able to bless me and rebuke the enemy for my sake? Look, God doesn't need our money. I cannot say that enough. So this is what truly confuses me. And it wasn't long ago, so I understand if, if maybe you're new to faith, you're new to the church, and you don't understand this concept of giving and what it really means. Look, I have empathy for you because I truly, I, I've been there. So sympathy and empathy, let me say it that way. I, I, do, I do understand. But it's amazing to me who people who trust God for their salvation, their eternity in heaven, their final resting place, do not trust God with their finances. What is the logic in that? However, I will stand on that side and say, I also went down that road because I found the Lord Jesus Christ when I was 10 years old. I was raised in the church. I spent a lot of time in the church. I was a volunteer for a long time inside the church. Made a lot of money in my early years. Didn't begin to tithe religiously. Smile is a funny word. To about a few years ago. And I will tell you that the monumental moves that I have made in my life, they are not, it's not about me. So some of the stories that I will share today, they are not about me. Please remove, just let me be the mouthpiece today. They are not about me. But I want you to hear the faithfulness of what God will do in your life when you trust him. If we can trust God with our eternal destiny, don't you think we can trust God with our careers, our finances, and our tithe? See, we pray some of the most sincere prayers to the Father in our prayer closet, on our knees, when nobody's watching us. You know how many people have been healed through prayers in Cornerstone? Too many to count. We're talking cancer eliminated, marriages restored, life-altering moves blessed and seen through front to back. But how often do we really say, God, I really, really need you in the area of my finances? More scripture, 2,300 plus some scriptures is wrote about money. Crazy part about this, I believe there's 38, don't quote me to this, don't shoot me, 38 parables that Jesus spoke about. 16 of them, so 42% of those are related to money. So let's just go ahead and round up a little bit and say nearly half of the parables that were shared. I think Jesus was on to something here. I really do. Look, the tithe has always been the floor, not the ceiling, of giving to God's work. In other words, the way to say this, it's the place to begin. It's not the place to end in God's kingdom business. Look, God wants the first of everything. This started back in Genesis 4 when God rejected Cain's offering and accepted Abel's. Why did God reject Cain's offering? Read it. It was not the first fruit. There's a key word that stated that Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. So the tithe, 10%, is what belongs to God. He set that apart. Leviticus 27.30. That's good for taking notes if you want that one. It all belongs to him, but he set the tithe apart for himself. The tithe is really you truly saying to your finances that God is first and he will do more with my 90% than he will with my 100%. In our area of logic as adults and going through college and high school and graduating, maybe with MBAs and doctorates, yes, that doesn't make sense. But God is the God of the impossible. So we trust in that, we believe in that, and we rest our faith and assurance in him. So let's do some math. If you make 100 bucks in a week, how much belongs to God? Good answers. Everybody was wrong. It's 100 bucks. It all belongs to him. So let's say it this way. <laughs> if I make $100, how much do I tithe? I love how some people begin to look at their spouses. Look, I'm not that good to have two trickeries up here, two jokes. But yes, $10. That is the tithe. I want to share a testimony on tithing. So there's a couple in the church that I have known for a long time. 
incredible people. A few years back, we went out to lunch, just me and this man. We went, decided to go to uh, you know, a very classy, classy restaurant, uh, Subway. And uh, we began to talk about what God was doing in our life and what God had done and the belief of what he will do. So 100% unprovoked by me, mind you, so let's go back years ago, I was not in ministry. He said, Tyler, are you a Tyler? <laughs> that's, pretty, that's a pretty bold statement. I'm right. Um, well, share your story first. Let's go. So he says, and he begins to share his testimony, and he says, you know, my wife and I for a long time lived paycheck to paycheck. Every single week we were trying to write checks, we were trying to pay debt off, and no matter what we did, we just couldn't get ahead. And they sat down at the dinner table week over week, month over month in this same pattern. And no matter what they did, they just could not get ahead. They had late payments that were mounting. They had people calling. They had people knocking on their doors. They had people that were so concerned about their money that didn't even belong to them. They needed a break. So finally one day, him and his wife, they sat down at the dinner table and they began to truly say to God, look, we have put you first with our children. We have put you first with our careers. We have put you first with everything, but we truly haven't put you first with our finances. They wrote their first, their first tithe check. They began to weep as they wrote this check out because they knew the outcome of this is now they're $300 short now for what their overall monthly budget is. They wrote the check, they prayed over it, said, Lord, bless me with this tithe seven times over so I can go fulfill your kingdom work. So they drove to church, offering buckets came by, dropped it in there, they slapped hands because they were so excited. It was the first time that they had tithed together as a couple. Ecstatic. So his first check that he wrote was $300. Please do not look at the value of what it is, just remember the number. So as their way home, they have a community mailbox, and if you're not familiar with community mailboxes, you literally check your mail like once every six months. Like your mailbox is so stuffed, and they're the same way, right? Because they just know what's inside this. They know that's gonna be more late payments, more overdraft, just all the issues that they have been, that I have laid out for you. So they go ahead and they pull it all out. They drive back to the house. They go to the, the dining room table and they lay out all the checks. And when they lay out all the checks, they have this one that says open immediately. And it hits him. He says, oh, we're cut off. This is it. I know they're late. No matter how hard we're trying, we just can't get ahead. So they open up the, they open up the top of it. They rip it off. He pulls it out. And to their amazement, there was a check wrote to them for $2,100. And I want you to go tell that man that God does not bless you when he ties because he will look you in the face and say you're wrong. See, the only area that God clearly comes out and says in his words, he wants us to test him, is in tithe. See, we as humans, we didn't have anybody to teach us this. If you were a parent, or you, or you all have been kids, nobody taught you to ever hear your mom say this. Touch that again. I'm gonna find, you're going to find out what's going to happen. Test me again, son. And what happens? Man, that hand comes back around and smack you in the back of the head so quick. Nobody taught us to do that. That's just our natural nature is to what? To test people. We want to know their character. We want to know who they are and what they're like. That is our human instinct. And this is our one and opportunity that we have to test God. And so many of us don't, and I know the reason why. It's because we don't trust. Here's the difference. You can come to faith with a closed hand. But you can't trust with the closed hand, you got to open it. Does it, does it, does it make sense, right? You, you can come to faith, right? I mean, Paul came, bang, knocked off a donkey, G-rated version, and came to the Lord. But we look at maturity, and that took a long time. He didn't write a third of the New Testament overnight. That took time. So we come to the Lord, and we have that opportunity, but over time we begin to, we need to what? Trust and start giving those things up in our life that we say, God, those are yours, they're not mine. We sit back and we say, he cannot supply my financial needs. Look, this is the same God 
who won't let the birds go without food and water. This is the same God who created light. This is the same God that created you. This is the same God that parted the seas. This is the same God who sent his son to this earth to die for your sins and mine so we can have eternal life with him in heaven. Look, it even says that the oceans roar his name. That the flowers, as they begin to sprout off the ground, they sing praises to the creator, to their father in heaven. And it even says that the rocks will cry out to him, even if we don't. When was the last time somebody saw a rock talk? And it says clearly that if we won't, they will. So who are we trusting? If he can supply all these needs to creation... Don't you think he can supply your needs? Look, this is the same God who sent his tithe to this earth in the form of his son. What? God sent his what? His what? His first and only son. Do you think God wouldn't fulfill what he started in Genesis 4 and then back again in Exodus 13 and then reminding us again in Leviticus 27.30? Look, it comes down to the trust factor because we've lived our lives broken people. We've trusted people. We've been broken. We've been brandished. We've been kicked to the curb. We've been treated like meat. So that's what we're used to. But there's no plot twist to God's love. All right, done preaching. For those that are tithers, listen, listen, this is so, this is so good. As we grow in our walk with him, we should become more sacrificial in our giving. We should be giving according to our abilities because we've trusted God with our first fruits, but are we trusting him with the rest? Remember, it all belongs to him anyways. Look, I come back to this. This is not saying that because you're a tither, you need to give more and you need to go for broke. This has nothing to do with that. This is not a begging you for more message. Please, if that's what you thought, just, just hit delete, restart now. Pick me back up. That's the farthest thing from what I'm wanting to say. See, God wants us to trust him and we should sacrifice in our finances. A sacrifice may be freely given, but it's not a genuine sacrifice if it doesn't mean anything to us. Here's the difference. You give your grandkids or the neighbor kid five bucks, no big deal. Struck them a check for a thousand, we're talking a whole different level of ball field here, right? right? Because it's sacrifice, it digs deep, it really means something to you. Look, as we, this is, here, write this down. As we grow in our faith, we give our sacrifices to God more freely because we understand his greater sacrifice that allows us to know his grace. And look, today's message can be applied more than one way than just money. Your time. How do you spend time with God? Look, I love Netflix and chill. I absolutely love Netflix. I mean, my wife, she crushes Netflix. I got to watch a really bad show last night because she loves this girly show, right? This is what it is. I had to forfeit a little college football, a little sacrifice. It's a joke. It's not, that's not real sacrifice. But our talent, do, we're all gifted in the kingdom. Do you have a talent that you are not using, but you say, you know, I, I work 40 hours a week. I'm really sleepy. I got a lot of kids. Man, Jesus preached every single message with the cross on his mind. Our treasures. Think about that, our treasures. We already talked about what he thought about treasures. He's got gold. We're our feet, and they won't be dirty, they'll be clean, but our feet will be walking on gold. Jewels and rubies everywhere. Look, if you come to Steps, you're going to hear this story, so act surprised and happy that you're hearing it again when you're there on November 17th. But years ago at our Deltona campus, which is where Steps is at also, too. I'm sorry I didn't say that. We had a gentleman in our church who was extremely broken. He was broken at the point being financial, emotional, and he was just severely distraught. And there was a few of us that knew exactly what had happened to him prior to that week. So one of our pastors at the time was, was sharing, as you guys heard Josh do earlier, the offering meditation. Now, we don't share people's story one, without their permission, and two, to look for, for self-gain or to talk about 
cornerstone. So the pastor decided to tell the entire church body that this man had lost everything the day before. He was a carpenter. His truck was stolen. His trailer was stolen. And all of the tools that were inside it that made his job necessary for him each and every day to do, gone. So at the time that the tithes had been collected, we passed them up and down the rows just like we do here. There was a man that was in the far right corner after it was all done. He stood up with a $20 bill in his hand, and he says, I have $20 to go to this man. So this is unscripted, right, unprovoked. He walks over to the man on the other side in front of everybody and lays a $20 bill at his feet. For the next 25 minutes, some 200 people began to sacrificially give to this man. They wrote checks. They laid cash. They laid coins. They laid gift cards. Anything that they had that day to supply that, and I promise you, if if online giving was that time, I'm sure that thing would probably have been broken because it couldn't contain the resources that were coming in. In 25 minutes, this man had a puddle of tears to the point where the ink was being rubbed off the check because he was sobbing that hard. And in 25 minutes, the Lord brought $30,000 to this man's feet so he could go the next day and begin his work. Look, that has absolutely nothing to do with Cornerstone. That has everything to do with the obedience of people going and listening to what God wants them to do through the Holy Spirit and laying down sacrificial gifts at this man's feet. Look, this is for somebody here today. Sometimes your storm is somebody else's blessing. So the last story of sacrifice. I was in college, broke, and I was wanting to ask my girlfriend, now wife, to marry me. And there was a time in our church a long time ago that there was some rough spots that we were working through financially. New ministry, a lot of new bumps, a lot of bruises. And it was time for us, for me at least, as I talked about, to really begin to become not a a donator, but a tither. And I I wasn't really feeling my tithe. It comes back to what I said earlier about sacrifice. It really should mean something to us. It was laid out for us so beautifully scripted by God when he sent Jesus, his only son, to to this earth. So I was in my room the night before, Not studying the Bible, don't tell nobody. And I saw this shoe box. And it was my it was called my ring box. This is where I put all I was a I was a I was a bartender at the time. And this is where I would put all my little extra dollar bills and coins and little things that I would get from from customers that really didn't have a whole lot of, you know, because the the big tips and all the other stuff, that was what paid my way through college. So I looked at that ring box and it was just boom, it hit me. God laid it on my heart that I need to sacrifice that. And I don't know if you've ever had something laid on your heart so clear and so loud from God that you actually become Moses and you begin to debate with him. Like, uh, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, that. I've worked really hard for that. And mind you, I spent like zero time in the Old Testament growing up, which is a really sad story in itself because they're so much good, good, good wisdom, and God's word is so good all over the Bible, but I love the Old Testament. I open up my Bible, and I didn't do the, you know, drop your finger there type thing, because sometimes that can lead to a really bad spot. I came across 2 Samuel 24, 24. It says, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings, and that cost me nothing. So now I knew, all right, God, thank you for laying that out for me. I knew that it was no coincidence that I had laying there. I had to go to work that day, and I'm not sharing this story for self-pity, for glory for myself. This has nothing to do with me. I had to leave to go to work. 
So I grabbed my bag out of my, I don't even know what it was at the time. I had to wear a vest to work and a tuxedo. So I, I pulled it out, and I walked up to the stage, and I laid it there in the middle of the message. Awkward, uncomfortable. God had me where he wanted me. Because in that comfort, where are we finding our strength? We're finding it on ourselves. So my dad, who was preaching that day, he knew, I didn't really tell him what I was going to do, but he knew by the marking of the bag, because inside the shoebox was a bag, he knew what that was. I did not ask him to share it. I actually preferred him not to, because I'm very, I get the uncomfortable sweats and awkwardness when people bring me up on stage, so if I'm just the only one talking, it's all good, but if somebody points me out, right, it's pretty uncomfortable. And I knew that I had been led to do what God had told me to do. I wasn't looking for anything else. Well, put it this way. I knew he was going to bless me because he's God and I'm not. So a few weeks later, there was a lady in the church who walked up to me. She had her hand like this. And she grabbed my hand and she says, Tyler, I need to give you something. In her hand was her engagement ring from her great-great-grandmother that was exactly the same amount of money that I gave so I could in return trade that in and go buy my wife her engagement ring. I do not share that story to tell you what I have done. I share that story to tell you what God will do when we are faithful. As we come to the close and we're, we're getting ready to have the ability for anybody to come forward to be prayed with, to be prayed over. And yeah, this message was about money and stewardship and things that we, that we need to do in our lives through obedience. But there is something that's been done for you. And that was Jesus coming to this earth to die for your sins, to go onto a cross, to take the shame, the guilt, the worries, the burdens, and he took them and he left them there. But the problem is, is we so are so good at over the years, we just, we pick the ones back up. And we, and we stick them in our back pocket. That shame, that guilt, that's all there. The anxieties, the depressions, the fears, it was left there. You cannot rescue yourself. It's not your job. It comes back to he is God and we aren't. Fear is debilitating. Fear is what makes grown men shake, cry. Fear is of the enemy. If you have fear or worry about what people will think of you, I promise you this, as the applauds of heaven begin to erupt for a sinner coming home, we will erupt with the same joy because we know that it is nothing that we are doing but it is what God is doing in your life. Look, the Holy Spirit will lead you here. If you need to pray and fall to your knees at the altar, do it. We'll leave you alone. This is your time to come forward and to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your personal Savior. We do not close any service with, without doing that. As the band begins ready to sing, I would ask if you guys would go ahead and stand to your feet. For those of you that are prayer warriors, this is your time to begin to pray that God will do only what he can do. He is a good, good father. And he loves you. He wants you home. Come now. Hey guys, we're so glad you plugged into this week's message. We want to connect with you. Check us out at cornerstonechurch.co. Can't wait to see you next weekend.